See us through 2020. Father, we bless your name today. We thank you for all that you have done in our lives. We thank you that you have a plan for us. We don't always understand what it is, but you know what's best. Help us to trust your heart when we cannot trace your hand. We know that you are in control. Our life, 
And everything we have is in your hands. We depend upon you. Bless your word, strengthen us. We pray for salvation, forgiveness, healing. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. The Gospel of John, chapter 9, beginning at the first verse. I'm going to read scattered verses, and I pray that you read the entire chapter when you have the opportunity to do so. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? that he was born blind. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, is not this he who sat and begged. Some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him. He said, I am he. Verse 13, they brought the man formerly who was blind to the Pharisees. Now, it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. And the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put clay on my eyes and I washed and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was division among them. Verse 18, but the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. Verse 24, so they again called the man who was blind and said to him, give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know that though I was blind, now I see. Then they said to him again, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already. And you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, you are his disciples, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, why this is marvelous, why this is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from, yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him since the world began. It has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him and said to him, you were completely born in sins and you teaching us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard they had cast him out, and he found the man and said, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe? Jesus said, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Amen. Whether he is a sinner or not, verse 25, I do not know. 
One thing I know that though I was blind, now I see. I want to talk today about an out of order miracle. An out of order miracle. The man in the text has been blind since birth. All of his life, he could not see anything. Deprived of a normal upbringing, he could never read, he could never see colors, he could never look into his parents' face. And you know, the world we live in, people can be so cruel sometimes. Here this man has a disability from birth. No one can really explain or we don't really understand why this man cannot see. But yet in verse 3 of the chapter that we read, when the disciples see the man, they ask Jesus a question. It is a loaded question. It is a prejudicial question. It is a question loaded with bias and built off assumptions and misconceptions. When they saw the man blind, they asked, who did sin? This man or his parents? That's a messed up question. It's a question that has made assumptions. A question with bad theology. In other words, because this man has an illness or debilitation, somebody had to have done something wrong. The reason why this happened, the reason why this man is suffering, Jesus, we want to know, is it his mommy's fault? Is it his daddy's fault? Or is it his own fault? But it's somebody's fault. The reason why the miscarriage happened, the reason why the child died, what did they do wrong? The reason why you lost your job is because somebody did something wrong. The reason why your prayer was not answered, the reason why this person is struggling with mental illness, we have decided that the reason why this brother has HIV is because somebody somewhere surely did something wrong to deserve this. If they were going to be fair about the question, they could have simply asked the Lord, why was the man born blind? But they asked, who was it that messed up to cause this man to be born blind? That's church folk for you. That's what people do. Come to conclusions. We can be so spiritually deep and sophisticated that we think we have the ability to discern God's divine intentions for somebody else's life. We've come to conclusions on behalf of God. The disciples have determined that this man or his parents surely must have messed up for this to be this man's lot in life. I don't know about you, but I'm glad, I'm glad that God is God and man is not God. The good news is that what they saw as a mistake, Jesus saw as an opportunity to make a miracle. Am I right about it? Jesus said in verse 3, neither has this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in this man. Good news about God is it really doesn't matter what you did or did not do. It does not matter if you did mess up or did not mess up. It doesn't matter if you failed, if you fell apart. But make no mistake, there is no mistake, there is no mess, there is no failure. That this is just an opportunity for God to show what he can do. There's nothing that God cannot overcome. There's no sin that God cannot forgive. The fact is the man that was born blind... It was not at all about the fact of who messed up, but it's all about the God who can fix it up. But all the disciples were looking for was the sin when Jesus was looking for the salvation. My brothers and sisters, God is a good God. And the reason why this man was in this condition was so that God could show off his power. 
Somebody said, God, man's extremity is God's opportunity. Jesus took it upon himself to heal this man. Notice in the text that the man did not offer to he offer I ask for healing, but Jesus decided that he wanted to heal the man. He took some clay, spit on it, and made some mud. A homemade pharmaceutical concoction of nothing but mud and saliva. Slapped it on the man's eyes and told him, I want you to go to the pool of Siloam, wash. And voila, the man was healed. You can now see. And my brothers and sisters, here it is that Jesus has used nothing but some mud. And one thing you best believe, it was not the mud that healed the man. Did Jesus use this mud? First of all, uh, the mud had no medicinal value to heal the man. So when the man came back seeing, one thing was for certain, you can understand that the healing was not from CVS or Walgreens Pharmacy. The healing was no doubt at the hands of Jesus. Are y'all with me here? Why, why did Jesus use the mud to touch the man's eyes? Well, I, I, I suggest that Jesus did not heal the man instantaneously like sometimes Jesus would merely speak the word and a person would be healed. Sometimes Jesus would touch the person and the person would be healed. But ordinarily when Jesus performed a miracle, he always indicated that he was looking for somebody to demonstrate some faith in order for the miracle to occur. So the miracle was initiated by somebody who asked, somebody who came, somebody who stepped out like the woman with the issue of blood to have faith to believe in Jesus. So this man did not ask. This man did not do anything. And so Jesus took the mud, put it on his eyes, and then gave him instructions that you're going to have to take your step of faith, go to the pool of Siloam, obey my word, and then you're going to be healed man went back home and people started noticing something different about the brother. They see him and they have to do a double take. They're starting to second guess. This, this can't be brother blind man that we've known for years. The man that we knew couldn't see. How can this be? They had a difficult time understanding it. And they asked the question, is not this he who sat and begged? They don't have a name for the man. Notice they define him by what he used to be. The one who could not see. The one who used to sit and beg. They define him by his past, by who he used to be, by what he used to do. Sometimes people will never let you forget what you used to be and always want to rewind you back to the mistakes you made or replay you back to when you were down in the dumps. Cannot understand that you've been changed and have a hard time accepting the reality that you're no longer who you used to be. They went to the man in verse 10. How, how, how did this happen? The man said, some dude by the name of Jesus and I heard him talking to some of his folks, and he said, the reason why I've been blind all my life is not that I've been cursed. I heard him telling his folks that, that the trouble I've been going through in my life was never a form of punishment for any wrongdoing. The reason why I've been broke all my life, the reason why I've been disabled, I heard him say that the reason why I've been so weak and vulnerable is so that God could show himself strong. I heard him say... The reason I was sick was so that God could show himself a healer. And so he said, Jesus took some clay, spit on it and made some mud, slapped it on my eyes, and now I'm healed. And I don't know why the people did this, but verse 13 tells us the first thing they did was they took the man to the Pharisees. The religious leaders of their day, the Pharisees, the ones who had the insistence on the binding force of the oral tradition of the law, and they were always often in opposition to Jesus, always seemed to have a beef and a problem with Jesus. They took the man to Jesus, 
And they refused to believe that the man was actually blind. And they, in verse 18, essentially accused him of lying. And it got so bad that, you know what, they went to the man's mother and father and started interrogating him. My, my brothers and sisters, here it is that, that Jesus has done this amazing miracle. He, he has healed this man. Jesus did something that nobody else could do. No surgery could accomplish. No pharmaceutical jump, giant could accomplish. He had no money with nothing but mud. And here these people come that were not actually a part of the healing service. They had no part and parcel in the performance of the healing. This is crazy. They show up after the fact and had a whole lot to say and criticize about what happened. And here is this man, a neophyte, brand new believer in the church. And they ran him down. They interrogated him. They investigated him. They harassed him. They went to the FBI on the man and threw the book on the man's story. They refused to believe. They went to his parents to ver verify the veracity of Jesus' healing. They talked bad about Jesus to the man. Verse 16, my brothers and sisters, they said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. How can a man who is a sinner, he's a sinner, how could he do this? After God has turned this man's life around, after spending years of suffering, he was not only unemployed, but he was unemployable. Can't see, can't read, can't walk on his own without assistance. Jesus transformed this life, this man's life, of all the things you could find to complain about, according to them, it was because it was done on the Sabbath day. Jesus healed on the wrong day. And they had issues because Jesus healed outside of their jurisdiction. They missed the miracle. And you know what it was? They had a problem because they were not the ones to manage the miracle. They have concerns, they have complaints, they have criticism because they could not contain and control what Jesus did. Here it is, God has done something marvelous and amazing. A man's life has been changed. This man has been greatly blessed. God has shown up in supernatural powers. God has done something nobody else could do. God has moved in this man's life with a mighty miracle. His life will never be the same again. His life has been renewed. New opportunities are before him. And you would think after all of that, that there would be an eruption of praise and celebration among the people of God. You would think that they would encourage him and show the man who's now able to see, show him around town and show him the beauty of God's creation. But my brothers and sisters, they criticize and they complain about what God had done. Y'all stay with me for just a few moments here. The man was healed. God had moved in the man's life. But here they are. Here they are, and when God does something like this, I don't care what day of the week it is, what protocol may have been bypassed, a praise ought to be made to God in unison with the rejoicing of the angels in heaven praising God over the salvation of one sinner who comes to repentance. Are y'all with me here? Uh, my brothers and sisters, another thing that ought to never happen is for you and I to come behind what God has done in the same fashion as these Pharisees with no worship, no praise. We were nowhere to be found, had no part in the deliverance and the healing, and yet we come behind Jesus. They came behind meddling with some mess about the man. Can I say this, my brothers and sisters? One thing we ought to always be careful to recognize is that the Holy Spirit is in charge of the church of Jesus Christ. And that whenever, whenever, whenever God moves and works 
and heals and delivers. And it doesn't have to be me only. It doesn't have to be you only. But whenever God moves and works and shows himself out, somebody ought to be in agreement with God with a celebration of praise and thanksgiving. We should be the ones to step aside and allow God to do what he does. And only response that I should have is to glorify and magnify his name. I don't know what it is about us in the church that we, we don't have a problem praising God when it's my turn. But can you praise God when God does it for somebody else? But there's a problem. There's a problem with this miracle. It's an out of order miracle on the wrong day in the wrong way by the wrong person. According to the Pharisees, this is not the way this was supposed to be done. This was not done in the right place. It was not done in the right day. It was not done by the right person. Therefore, we're not going to praise God. Uh, my brothers and sisters, but I thank God. I thank God for the out of order miracles. And do I need to remind somebody that our God can sometimes be an out of order God? In other words, what I'm trying to tell us is that God does whatever God wants to do. He does it when he wants to do it. He does it how he wants to do it. Can I talk to somebody here? When Jesus fed the 5,000 men plus the, plus the women and the children, it was an out of order miracle. They said, Jesus, how can you do this when we don't have no food? We don't have no money to buy food from Kroger's. But Jesus said, set them down. He took the, borrowed two fish and five loaves from a young lad, prayed over it, and fed everybody. I thank God that he's an out of order God when the leper came to Jesus and said from off from a distance, Lord, if thou wilt, thou can make me whole. Now the Bible indicated that to touch a leprosy would, be, would make you to declare unclean, but Jesus was an out of order God who touched the leper and said, be made whole. The leper was made whole and Jesus was declared unclean. Can I talk to somebody here? I'm talking about some out of order miracles. What about the woman with the issue of blood who went out of order, interrupted and butt through the cloud and she was unclean but she touched the hem of his garment and she was made whole but according to the scriptures because she touched him, Jesus was unclean. Can I talk to y'all for just a few moments here? The man with the withered hand, they complained because it happened to be on the Sabbath day. It was out of order. What about the Gadarene demoniac when Jesus cast out the demons into the swine and the swine jumped off into the lake and drowned and the people got so mad at this out of order miracle that they told Jesus to get out of here. The man was delivered, but the people would rather have the money than the man. Jesus was so out of order that the law says, what are you going to do with this woman we caught red-handed in adultery? The law says, stone her. But Jesus said, let any one of y'all jokers who's without sin throw the first stone. But is it all right if I be out of order? He said, woman, go your way and sin no more. God forgave somebody out of order when the world said you would never be anybody, when the world said you would never be any good, when the world said you would never, when the world said you keep on messing up. But God said, I forgive you. God said, I love you. God said, I'll save you when nobody else wanted to be bothered with you. And what do you mean you can't give God an out of order praise? God is not bound by our bureaucracy. God is not confined to our constitutions. God is not limited to our laws. God is not restricted by our rules. God can do whatever he wants to do when he wants to do it and how he wants to do it. I don't know about you, God. God says he did it. He says, I'm doing this so that, so that God, the reason why you went through what you went through is so that God can be glorified. 
And whenever God does something for you, you ought to be able to give God the praise. I don't care if nobody else praises him. I don't care if you're in church or not in church. God is worthy of somebody's praise. But not in this text. They never invited the man. They investigated the man. They never encouraged the man. They interrogated the man. They never befriended the man. They belittled the man. They never communed with the man. They condemned him and they cast him out. They were religious and they were rigid and restricted. They had rules and regulations, protocols, policies, procedures, and politics. They were petty and particular. The truth be told, they were jealous and juvenile. The reason they investigated is that they were envious. They had an ax to grind with Jesus. The poor neophyte soul had been harassed by holy haters because it was the wrong day, the wrong time, the wrong person. They were upset that the man healed him. So what? What's Jesus going to do? Is he not going to heal them because of the haters? You cannot live your life trying to please everybody. They were upset that the man was healed. Whoever, whoever did this broke the traditions. Whoever did this did not follow the proper policies and procedures. Whoever did this did not check with us first for consent. They messed with the man and they came for the man. Verse 16, they bad-mouthed Jesus to the man. This man is not of God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. And just think for a moment the impact of this kind of assault could have had on the man who was healed. I, I, I'm concerned because this is a neophyte, brand spanking new believer who has no history, didn't know anything about Jesus before, doesn't know the Bible, and they have, I have a concern about this fussy, nitpicky negativity. Concern that these folk might dissuade and discourage the man such that he might become disillusioned with the church because of the constant petty attacks. I'm concerned that with all of this rigid religiosity, it might ruin him, that this churchianity might choke him and chase him away, that these weasels, I'm concerned these weasels will wear him out and he'll want to walk away and have nothing to do with those folks in the church. He could have strayed because of this. He could have wandered. He could have quit and said, I want nothing to do with these kind of people. He could have said, this church stuff is just not for me. But I'm glad the Bible said that God is able to keep that which we commit unto him. I'm glad the Bible said that God is able to keep us from falling, to present us faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. I'm glad, I'm glad that our God is a keeper. I'm glad that God promised that he would, he would finish, complete the work that he began in us. I don't care what anybody else says or what anybody else does. It's God and God alone who keeps you. I got to give this brother a lot of credit in the face of this fierce harassment from these pharisaical phonies feuding and opposing this brother. The brother had some backbone. They came against the man in verse 24 and demanded that he renounce Jesus and acknowledge Jesus was a sinner. But saints of God, I'm so glad to report that the man did not cave into the theatrics and the drama of the Pharisees. The attack was so severe that they tried to shake the man's faith. It got so nasty. Here is this mob of highfalutin Pharisees ganged up to tag team the brother educated, sophisticated, religious scholars join forces to plot against an uneducated, unemployed, illiterate babe in Christ, ran him down with religious persecution, trying to nail him to the wall with intimidation tactics of pious pressure. But praise God for all the knowledge and education that these Pharisees had. There was one thing this brother knew that they didn't know. There was one thing this former blind man knew that was not found in the Torah. There was one piece of knowledge that this low-income, 
brother on the street possessed that these erudite Pharisees had no knowledge of. Are y'all with me here? They came at the brother. They stepped to him with theological trickery. But praise God, the brother man wasn't having it. They called out Jesus to the man and said some bad stuff about Jesus. My brothers and sisters, can I tell you the first lesson we can learn is be careful about listening to rumors. Be careful about feeding into gossip. Be careful about believing everything you hear when folk talk about other people. Can I tell you, number two, the same thing, the same folk that talk to you about other people will one day in the same way talk about you to the same other folk that they talk to you about. Don't let it get to you so much when they talk about you. Can I tell you why? Because they talked here about Jesus. And if they talked about Jesus, they're going to talk about us. I just wish you'd stop believing everything you hear. Praise God, this man who had been healed did not fall for the bait. They told him, give God the glory only. But as for this Jesus, you tell the truth, this man is a sinner. The man answered and said in verse 25, whether he is a sinner or not, I got to tell you, I really don't know. You're trying to examine me in an area that I do not have competence. I cannot tell you who is right with God and who is not right with God. Deciding who is right with God is not in my territory of expertise. I must tell you, there's a whole lot of things that I don't know. I've never studied the Torah. Don't claim to know the least bit, to be the least bit a scholar. But the man said to them, there is one thing that I do know. However you want to talk about this Jesus, whatever you got to say about him, I cannot speak to that. But I got to tell you that there is one thing that I do know. And he says, I once was blind, couldn't see a doggone thing, not much I know. Whatever you want to say about him, all I know is I once was blind, but can I tell you, but now I see. And I'm just wondering, is there anybody that has a two-part testimony? Is there anybody who knows who you once were? But is there anybody who also knows but now what the Lord has done for me? The man says, I once was blind, but now I see. And he says, I tell you, I'll argue with angels about that one. But I'll tell you, and I'll tell anybody, and I'll tell everybody what the Lord has done for me. And can I tell you what the Pharisees did to the man? They threw the man right out of their church. And he said, you can throw me out of the church. You can take away my membership. But one thing you're not going to take from me, you're not going to take away my testimony. You can interrogate me. You can investigate me. You can test me all you want to. But there's one thing that I found out for myself. And I know what the Lord has done for me. Is there anybody who could testify that if I don't know nothing else, if I got no other reason to praise God, I'll give him praise because of what I used to be. But I thank God for what I am today. One thing I know, what the Lord has done for me. And I'm not about to sit up here and keep quiet and not give God the credit and the glory for what God has done in my life. The man said, I may not be able to quote all your church cliches. I may not be able to recite all 18 articles of the faith. I may not be able to recite the Hebraic names of Yahweh. 
I may not understand the Christological concept of the Trinity. I may not be able to rattle off the 66 names of the books of the Bible, but can I tell you there's just one thing I know, and the one thing I know is going to keep me from losing my mind. And there's one thing that I will do. I don't care who you talk about. I don't care what you say about me. There's one thing that I'm going to do. The Bible says after they threw him out that I'm glad Jesus went to find the man. And when the man found out who it was that healed him, when the man found out who Jesus was, the Bible says the man worshipped him. Can somebody say yes? I'm going to praise him and I'm not going to let anybody or anything stop me from giving God the praise. Can somebody say God's been too good that after they threw the man out of their little church, the man still had a mind to magnify his name. Don't you worry about your naysayers. Don't you get caught up in the criticism. Your God has been too good to you that you ought to be able to praise his name. Is there anybody who knows what the Lord has done for you? Is there anybody here and you've been sick and couldn't get well, but you know that the Lord healed your body? Is there anybody and you've ever been down, but you know that the Lord picked you up is there anybody and you've ever been down and out but you know the Lord brought you back in I said is there anybody and you cried all night long but you know for yourself that it was the Lord who dried your tears is there anybody here who ever had a child gone astray but you prayed and you prayed and you know that it was nobody you know that it was nobody you know that it was nobody but the Lord who did it for you can somebody do like this man and give God a praise it may be an out of order praise but this is my praise can somebody say I'll praise him in the grocery store I'll praise him in the funeral home I'll praise him in the hospital I'll praise him in the morning I'll praise him in the evening I'll praise him when the sun's going down can somebody say I feel can somebody say I feel like praising him can somebody say yes when I think of what the Lord has done for me amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found was blind can somebody say but now forget about what you once was but now I once was blind but now I see I once was a failure, but now I'm forgiven. I once was troubled, but now I'm triumphant. I once was victimized, but now I'm victorious. I once was a mess, but now I'm a miracle. And forget about what I once was, but I thank God for, but now I am what God says I am. Can anybody give God a praise? Can somebody say, yeah, this praise that I have, it may not be in your order, but this praise that I have, the Pharisees didn't give it to me, and the Pharisees can't take it away. Can anybody say, thank you, thank you, thank you for what you've done, you've done for me, what nobody else could do, nobody else. But the Lord, nobody, nobody, nobody healed your body. Nobody made a way for you. I'll praise him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 
One thing you ought to know, if you don't know nothing else, is what the Lord has done for you. Not what he's done for your brother. Not what he's done for your sister. But think about it. What the Lord has done for me. Can you remember your once was? You once was broke. You once was sick. You once was depressed. You once was addicted. But now, but now, but now, I got to praise him for my but now. Hallelujah. Look at where God brought you from. Look at what God brought you out of. Don't you let nobody steal your joy. Don't you let nobody steal your praise. God's been too good. Oh, thank 